Okay. Uh, but let's go ahead and open with some of our sponsors, Scott. We've got Real Water Sports today, Athletic Greens. And I think, I mean, we could talk about the boardroom show because Need Essentials will yes. be there too. Yes, absolutely. Well, look, Real Get Water Sports, our, our friend Trip Foreman at Real Water Sports. Uh, this is a real surf shop in the sense that you've got hard goods galore, wetsuits, surfboards, fins, the stuff that you require to actually participate in our lifestyle. And Tripp and his crew there have done a great job of outfitting their shop with uh, all the killer gear and uh, real water sports. It's uh, the real deal. They are the real deal. And good news is you don't even have to buy anything. They're going to give it away to you for free at realwatersports.com slash podcast. One lucky person who signs up there um, is going to be selected on October 4th or 5th. I, I, I keep forgetting, but I think it's picked on the 4th, announced on the 5th. And um, that person will get to select any single surfboard from the Real Water Sports inventory for free. And I was going to suggest people go there right now and start fantasizing, start picking out boards, but the inventory is going to change. So maybe get a few and then one or two might shift out, but then new ones will come in. So stay current. Realwatersports.com is the website, but realwatersports.com slash podcast is where you sign up. Would it be bad if I won the surfboard? Would this be bad? Because I may have entered a few times. It's, it would just be, uh, <laughs> I think it would be cosmic injustice, not because of the partnership, but because you own more surfboards than most humans on the planet or than most surfers on the planet and that would be not yeah. fair here's true. here's I, the deal I, I do i will not win i do not want to win if i do win I, of course I, I really haven't signed up let's actually do this if you okay. win you have to give away yeah. three of your surfboards to listeners this is a good idea i like this let's do this consider your, it wife, done. your wife pitched this to me before we started recording i bet <laughs> she wanted to clear out the garage um so yeah, realwatersports.com slash podcast. And then did you get your new package of athletic greens with a new branding? I don't think I have. All right. Well, it should be there any day then. Okay. Um, Killer. Athletic greens. Athleticgreens.com slash surf. They're rebranding. You're getting a sweater. You're getting socks. You're getting AG1? all sorts of stuff. AG1. That's it. AG1, baby. Drink your AG1. New solution. A new formula. I've had, I had mine this morning, um, athleticgreens.com slash surf. It's 75 vitamins, minerals, nutrients, all compressed, actually pulverized into a powder that you just mix with water. It's your one-stop dietary, uh, one dietary stop, one-stop solution for your diet and uh, get it all in one place and support the show. Do it. AG1, athleticgreens.com. Hell yeah. Slash surf. Slash surf. Slash surf. Thanks. All right, Scott, I am going to open the show with... Wait a minute. What? I haven't opened the show. Open it oh, after this gonna... call. Open I it got... after this call. Hey, what's up, guys? This is your boy, Joel Turdpel, a.k.a. Troll Tutor, uh, down here in Texas, getting my wave count on with uh, the tankers come in, you know, get my band, my band gravy on my soft top. It's all good every hour on the hour. So anyway, shout out, you know, question, you know, Scott, the pod father of Surf Talk Radio, what does that make, you know, David, the second coming? So what kind of name would be good for him? I think uh, David Lee, Lee's Christ. You know, that's what I'm talking about. David Lee, second coming. Come on. Hey, guys, this is your boy, Joel Turdpale, a.k.a. Troll Tutor Cone back from Texas, you know. Sorry about that comment about Cone David Lee, uh, Jesus Christ. I think that's a little too sensitive. Topic, hot topic. Don't want to get anyone triggered. So I'm thinking something a little bit on lines of fun, rock and roll. Well, he's named after David Lee Roth. So from here on out, he's David Lee Frost. Okay, boy, see you later. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy. Welcome, everybody. It's the Spit Podcast, the day after the WSL Finals, the Rip Curl WSL Finals, and it's Scott Bass with David Lee Froth. What do you think? You're the pod father? Yeah. Maybe David Lee Froth? <laughs> kind of like David Lee's Christ. 
that's pretty radical. But David Lee Never. Roth works too. Is so is David Lee's Christ offensive? Will we get Probably. canceled? Probably. So is David Lee Froth. I mean, every, look, it's impossible not to be. Uh, I think if we're being offensive, if that's offensive, then um, perhaps we may have lessened our audience by a few, but we've added to the quality through subtraction. Could not agree with you more. I like Lisa's Christ too. That's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what do you got to say? <laughs> well, welcome like, to the show, Scott. Yeah, man. Big sure. day in surfing. Hey. Big uh, yeah. day in surfing yesterday. Do we cover that or do we do recaps from last show? Where do we go? Let, let's do recaps and then we'll get into yesterday. Okay. Follow up. Uh, there was a number, there's a quite a lot of follow up to the scales of justice from last episode. Matt wrote in to you and I both and he said, Scott, I know you already said you felt badly, but let's put things into perspective. Two guys that know each other with one of their kids are sitting on a tiny peak all by themselves. Then some random guy comes up, decides to sit right next to them, shoulder to shoulder. A wave comes presumably pretty quickly after you got to the peak. And one of the guys decides to let it go. And the second guy paddles along with you. Both of you miss it. Next wave, you drop in on the guy. Honestly, I'm surprised the other guy wasn't more pissed at you. Thanks for sharing these stories, though. Love the podcast. And honestly, my favorite stuff is the randomness that comes up. Keep the life lessons coming so we can all learn from your mistakes. <laughs> well, Matt's, Matt's kind of right in, in some regard there. I mean, he's not wrong. Um, he's not <laughs> wrong. I did. So a lot of those things did occur, like, they paddled out right before me, though. They weren't okay. sitting out there. They that is important. Right before me. But I guess my question to Matt is, am I not allowed to paddle out and sit on uh, the peak that I've been surfing for 40 years? Because there's two uh, guys out? <laughs> it's not like I paddled to he, the top of the peak and took position, pole position. I sat and waited. So great question. And I don't think that's what Matt's saying, but Matt's offering you those guys perspective and those guys yes. don't know who's been there for 40 years or not. So no, from their right. perspective, they're sitting there first and then you yes. paddle out. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's I actually, when I read that last week, I was like, you know what? Yeah. It's good to look at things from others perspective. You know, that's what empathy is all about, right? Living in somebody else's shoes. And for sure, they see some grumpy, crusty guy that can't even really get to his feet anymore, throwing <laughs> salty, throwing salty eyeballs all over the place with a scowl on his face. And they're like, oh no, not this dickhead. And sure enough, there I was. Matt kind of <laughs> nailed Matt kind of nailed it. I do my best to be to bring love and tolerance to the lineup these days, however. Sometimes be, I fail. I'm not perfect. If I can speak uh, about our own podcast. I think that's what's great about some of these conversations is that each person listening can kind of relate to both and all sides of the argument. Like I fully can understand why you feel the way that you felt and the, the level of entitlement that comes with surfing somewhere for 40 years. But I fully understand why those guys felt the way that they felt too, you know? Well, I think the question of entitlement is, is one that interests me personally. Like I, I'm just, I'm wondering where the listeners, I wonder where somebody like Matt or any of the listeners, how they feel about entitlement in general, regardless of how you, um, how you think you, des why you think you deserve whatever it is you deserve, because um, I, that's where I find myself, I get in my, I get in most trouble, you know? Yeah. Um, because there's expectations that come with entitlement that nobody else has but me, which are and they're and they're false. You know, they're like as much as it goes against my grain, sort of. Because on some level, there is something to be said for the guy that's put in a lot of time. But some would argue, well, you know what? His actions in the water should should sort of um, show that he's put it in 40 years in other words he shouldn't have to claim it it should just come out in his ability to kind of assess the situation and get the waves or you know what i mean and i don't know i don't know if well, I'm so 
Really. You are, you are, and I think it's an it's a very interesting topic, entitlement, and I think we can both agree that it comes with um, a lot of bad behavior, probably more bad behavior than good. And so I guess the question would be, is there any benefit? Is there any good version of entitlement? Or is there any justified entitlement? Is there any virtuous entitlement? Man, I don't, you know. Or is it all bad? I mean, if you, if anyone paddles out and they're like, I get something that you don't get because of X, because of I believe I'm entitled for whatever reason. I just bought a house here or I've surfed here for 40 years or, you know, whatever the reason is. If you're paddling out with expectations, it's probably going to go bad for you, first of all, on, yeah. on some level. So it's better to probably not have that, right? Right. But, but I also see, like, I'll paddle out and I'll see, like, for example, a great example is somebody like Dale Dobson. Now, Dale doesn't surf anymore, but just a few years ago, he was still surfing. And I would paddle out and I would be like, holy crap, there's Dale. And I give Dale and everybody basically would give Dale a pretty wide berth because he's frigging Dale Dobson. He was switching. He was surfing switch foot in 1970 and ripping both ways. You know what I mean? And so, you know, that's just me. And, and there's other guys like that in the lineup where you go, oh, OK, you know, like going to give him a wide berth, you know, going to. It's so and, crowded. It's so crowded now. And people didn't have the same rites of passage as you and everybody else. So they wouldn't know who Dale Dobson was and they would just burn him, you know. <laughs> Well, that would be a bad move because Dale would bark pretty hard at you. <laughs> that, so I, it's, what's interesting is that in any other scenario, like you've been surfing there 40 years, those people who were at that peak were ostensibly your guests without them knowing it and without you wording it that way. That's but not, if you, I don't agree with that. I mean, that sounds really entitled. They're, it how does. Are they my guests. Well, let me put it this way. Let me make an analogy. God's guests, not my guests. Perfect. So you own a home. And if you have people come over to your home, you give them the better. Like if you're having dinner, give them the better cut of meat. You go out of their out of your way. If there's only one chair available, you let them sit in that chair kind of a thing. And so, but once we're out in the wild and those things aren't actually owned through legal transactions, but you feel like you, you've been there 40 years. These other people are there. We don't, we don't feel the same level of, um, you know, gra whatever graciousness with the other people in the lineup. We feel like we need to assert to let them know that it's ours. Yeah. That's Which where the problem of, lies kind of right there. We can be That's gracious in this one area or in lots of other areas, but in this one specific surf realm, we're not gracious at all. Well, throw it all out. even deeper than all this is that it's just frigging exhausting to go through this process each and every time you paddle out. It's just exhausting. It and really is. This, this and is that's why where I try the to question... surf by myself. I just don't want to surf with anybody anymore. <laughs> and that's the question of like, is there any positives of entitlement? I think once you start feeling entitled, it only spins out a bunch of negative consequence. Absolutely. Um, um, Absolutely. I was thinking one other thing though, when you said you've been there 40 years. An alternative argument to that is, yeah, you've gotten your fair share of this resource. Now let somebody else get some, you know? Like sure. Absolutely. That, that, that is absolutely could be turned on it. And yeah. I, in I the back say. of the line. Good for you. You got it for a very long time. Now these people, this yeah. kid right here, let them go. You know, what it's, else? It's what interesting. Other, what other feedback do we have, David? Um, <laughs> I got, uh -oh. Do you want to hear? Do you want to hear the one that Scott as Karen? It's related to the previous scales of justice. Sure, sure. Scott as Karen. Let me share the screen with you. That'll take me a second. It's just the best title as well. Oh, I can't hear it. I'm not hearing it. All right, hold on. I'm gonna just hold the mic up to the screen. Okay. David Lee, how you doing? Drummer Dave, checking in. Uh, this is for Spit in regards to the Scott Bass situation with uh, Scott counting the number of surfers showing up per car, and it it gets under his skin when four people show up in one car. Uh, my take on that is, Karen, 
mind your own business. Who made you parking lot monitor? It seems like every other podcast, Scott Bass has to come clean and say how he got into some sort of altercation out surfing because some guy paddled out to his peak instead of down the beach or some guy sat too close to the peak and he felt uh, it wasn't his turn or something. And Scott Bass always has to get him in the parking lot and apologize and bury the hatchet and say, let's be friends. And that's all cool and everything. But, dude, who made you the surf break monitor? Don't worry about what other people do. Just worry about what you do. So that's my take. You might think by that take that I don't like Scott Bass. That's not true. I do like Scott Bass. In fact, I think you ought to have a contest where you can win a round of golf with Scott Bass. So I'd like to try to win that. I like to play golf with Scott. But I do have this fear that he'd be the guy on the green that, you know, tries to tell everyone when they can and can't putt. Or, no, Drummer Dave, you can't use your driver on this hole. You've got to use your fly wood and lay up. You mind your business. Don't worry about what I do. Worry about what you do. All right. Good pod. See you. Drummer Dave. Drummer Dave. He kind of nailed it. In in many ways, this is my issue with myself, with my, is that I'm spending way too much time worrying about you and Drummer Dave and all the people and, you know, like, and, and that is, um, you should see the shit that goes on inside my head when I'm paddling out. It's crazy. I'm already having arguments with people before, you know, <laughs> from, from people down the beach. I, it's funny. I but can relate. Look, we so all anyway, relate. I You're the one who says that. it out loud, but we I all do. can relate. I, that's the thing. I'm kind of putting myself out there. I you really are. am. And, and I'm okay with that because um, I am who I am. You know, it is what it is. I'm not perfect. And, and I'm, but I, I, drummer dave kind of nailed it like i i spend way too much time you know what a a mentor of mine i have sort of a spiritual guru guy that helps me and his his take on this is what other people think of you is none of your business and i think you can inverse that too you know it's like what i think of other people is none of my business i should just stick to positivity and love and kindness and tolerance yeah which, by uh, the way, 99% of the time, I mean, I don't tell you 99% of the episodes that don't occur because they're not good for pot. That's true. And I think um, a lot of people don't have the self-awareness that you have too. Like the fact that you're even processing any of this is elevated and enlightened. A lot of people just go through feeling ire and anger when they're road raging or whatever. And they're just, they think that's how life is. They don't even uh, assess how to amend those things you know one so. more thing drummer dave <laughs> tell him i like i'd love to play golf with drummer dave and i'm actually not that guy on the golf course i don't care i want you to hit five wood <laughs> <laughs> um, drummer dave it's on bro let's play some golf well i got another uh email or drummer dave sends me an email i'll set up a round of golf with drummer dave okay drummer dave's listening right now he will he'll send it it. um and then i've got another i'm gonna wait till next week actually because it's it's a bigger one to unpack and i should prepare a segment for it but a potentially a new segment pitched by a listener that could be amazing okay we have the scales of justice we have we need a scott bass focus segment and i've got it oh god no 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 it's good it's not, it's not making fun of, um, well, do you have any follow-up from last week or should we get into finals day? We better get into, because we have a hard out, uh, pretty soon here. What time? 10? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to jump in Scott and tell you that I think yesterday was the most gratifying and exciting day of competitive surfing that I've seen in quite some time. The single best day of WSL competition since perhaps one of the Jaws challenges or something. Huh. All right. I agree with you on many, on, on sort of a, a global sort of 30,000 foot level. It was a huge success. It was engaging. It was exciting. It was fun to watch. The waves were pumping. The men's surfing was incredible. Um, the women's final was incredible. The, the, the first round or so of the women's surfing was a little bit lackluster. And I found myself in my um, engagement wandering. But overall, I would give um, the WSL and this finals day probably an eight and a half or a nine out of 10. Um, 
I think the shortcomings, the WSL did a phenomenal job. So the WSL did everything that they could do. The production was fantastic. Having Kelly and Mick in the booth was surreal. I mean, that was the best you could hope for, you know? Um, the Having a full week of events, I think, like sur- if you were there live, which I didn't go live, but I have friends who did, like having Dave Prodan do the live lineup podcast at the Rib Curl store right near the parking lot, um, having events kind of going around, making it a, they just did a phenomenal job. They had things to look forward to and engage with every single day. Then when the event actually ran, they hit a home run with the production. So I think they did a great job. You talked about the women's surfing not being fantastic, especially the early rounds. You and I were texting. And we were much more, we weren't as polite as you just were. I was telling you, this is horrendous. The very first heat, Joanne DeFay versus Stephanie Gilmore was horrendous. And so any of the shortcomings that we saw in terms of surfing prowess were a reflection of the athletes and not the WSL. The WSL did a phenomenal job. I was shocked at the disparity between the top two versus everybody else. And not yeah. even the top three, to be honest, even number three on both the men and the women's side fell quite a bit short. Yes. And so this validates a larger concept that we had talked about over and over again, which is fewer athletes, because the disparity between 32 and the top five is very, very vast. Well, now we know that's even that's true, even on kind of a more micro level. And if those I mean, honestly, Joanne DeFay, like. I mean, she beat Steph. So Steph, it's hard to call out Steph because she's a seven-time world champ. But Steph just was like, if this is how you show, if this is how you show up for game day, you need to seriously spend the next like six months with a personal trainer, not only in the gym but like a sports uh, therapy coach. Like, get your headspace right because this is unacceptable. On finals day, the waves are pumping and you can't put together a ten-point heat total. Completely unacceptable. Sorry, Steph. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't good. I mean, I agree when we were texting. One of the things that I suggested was, look, we're all tuned in. It's the first heat of the day. You yeah. should probably put the men out there first because we want to see something that makes us bite the hook and sink the hook into my mouth. Yeah. And when you put out surfing, either men or women, but in this case, women, that is below subpar, I spit the hook out and I'm like, yeah. I left, I went surfing. I was like, I'm yeah. out of here. And you know, thank God there's swell in the water. I'm sure a lot of people went surfing that morning. So I missed some of the stuff because I spit the hook out. And so that's something they might think about is putting the men out there first so that we're engaged right away. It's like all this buildup. And then you, you see two surfers bogging rails and eating shit and looking like they don't belong. And totally. that was a bit of a problem. I mean, and I don't think it has to do necessarily with men versus women. It just has to do with freaking put together a 10 point heat total. This is finals day. You should yeah. be posting tens, yeah, not 10 point heat feet. totals. Yeah. It's not like you There's don't have everything in front of you. Plenty of opportunity. There wasn't yeah. a lull. It was just like set wave. Oh, bog set wave. Oh, out of position. They're out of position for the first like few the boards. Waves. Their boards look chattery. Their boards didn't look yeah. like they were good, which is funny because they were talking up Steph's magic board and she went out there and just bogged. Totally. And the boards look like they, they needed, those girls needed more rail. I mean, if all you're going to do is bottom turns and top turns, those girls aren't going to the air. You might as well be riding a six, four. Yeah. You know, and let the rail do the work. Well, I touched on Mitch Salazar as a commentator in Mexico, being a good addition to the team, because I felt like he was actually offering negative opinion or not negative opinions, criticism. He was offering criticism that Joe Turpel definitely never offers. Chris Cote is all positivity, you know, and those guys are good at what they do, but if you never offer, if you never offer criticism, it quest, it makes the listener question your credibility. Is that a high five? No, I'm pushing back a little bit. Okay. I want to tell you that Joe and Chris are set up people. They're the guy, they're the hosts of the show. It's not their job to be critical. It's the color comedy. It's Rosie or say, what's the guy's name? Mitch Salazar. Mitch Salazar. (laughs) So, it's their What's job it? to be critical. I almost said Cesar. Anyway. So what so what he did in this was in that heat, he said, I hate to say it, but Steph looks off, you know, and he went on about exactly what you and I are going on about. And again, it's hard to say about a seven-time world champ, but let's talk about Joanne DeFay. 
Joanne DeFe won that heat. She lost the next heat, but she to Sally, but she does not look like world champ material. When you get her out there and you go, this is finals day. These are all world champion potential surfers. And you watch, I watched her surf. I was like, wow, okay. She does not deserve to be here vying for a world championship. You know, like if this is what you ask of us as the audience, we are allowed to then state that you guys did a failure by not putting world champs in. And that's again, because of what I talked about last time is these surfers didn't earn their way into the title shot. The beginning of the season said, we're going to give the top five in at least let them earn their way in. And I'm not convinced that Joanne would have. I think she's a great surfer and especially she won Huntington, you know, but when it's six foot out there, she was not going, she was not uh, going for the bigger rights and like going to do big power turns. She was looking for the shorter lefts that she could bang a couple of times. Cause that's her safety. And it's just, yeah, it's just not world champion stuff. And so on the men's side, I felt like Connor was clearly the inferior surfer but he came with all of the fire and tenacity that was missing from that first heat. So Connor hit the water and it's like, boom, on a set wave, bang, bang, bang. It's like, well, that's not going to compete with Gabriel or Idolo, but good job, Connor, for doing the best that you can and showing up with your A game. You know, I totally agree. I was thinking about it too, like that, like basically Connor surfed as good as he could possibly surf. Would you agree with me? And so, and so that means that he deserves to be number four in the world. Yeah. And, and I can't really say that of Morgan. I'm not sure if Morgan deserves to be number five, you know, based on his performance. I agree. And Morgan, and that's fine. And we, uh, we expected that of Morgan and we questioned whether we would see this because it's his rookie year. He did a way, I mean, the fifth is fifth place on a rookie year is a huge win. So congrats to Morgan for that. But all of the competitive savvy and handling of your nerves and all that sort of stuff takes years and years and years to suss out. So we weren't convinced that Morgan had sussed that out. And to be perfectly honest, Connor fully capitalized on it. Yeah, I, I, my hat's off to Connor. Well-deserved, well-served. I mean, he ripped. He, he did what we expected of him and a little bit more. Like he, he was polished. He had a plan. Totally. He went out there and did it. And, and totally. I was stoked for him. So um idolo is the other storyline here about how he utterly failed um because i i mean almost anybody would have put money on him over felipe but felipe trounced him basically so any thoughts on idolo and what happened um look i think felipe and idolo are pretty evenly matched and felipe surfed really really well i mean he won the heat you know um there were some moments like that first exchange, I think it was the first exchange where Elo was right behind Felipe on the second wave of the set. He did the big floater and he didn't really cap off the wave with a solid turn. There was a moment where he was, he lost a little dynamism. He wasn't quite as polished on that last hack. The board kind of got held up in the lip and it looked like he was kind of forcing his way back down the wave face. And so I just, you know, to me, that's, I mean, I guess in some ways I'm, I'm wondering, and I don't think time allows this, but at some point, maybe in the semis, it's good to have two out of three in the semis as well. Mm-hmm. You know, like let's lose the first round of four versus five, you know? And I think that two out of three in the semis and two out of three in the finals might be a little fair way to go, but it does. Then at that point, you've got guys surfing a lot more heats than the, than yeah. the last guy, but you know, that's why he's number one. That's why he, did, you know, you're number one. Cause he surfed well no, throughout the season. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, this is the divide between Gabriel and Idolo is Gabriel is Ivan Drago. Yeah. Right. It, where he's a machine yeah. and there's just nothing that's going, Idolo is showing a little bit of kinks in the armor, or I guess yeah. it's chinks in the armor is the appropriate. Yeah. And like I was watching Idolo throughout the year and just his body, the way that he's gotten his body into shape, I thought he was going to be the Ivan Drago. I thought I was just like, God, Idolo looks unreal. Like his, in, his stamina and endurance and all that, he'll be able to surf through the entire day at lowers without gassing and still be able to do his craziest surfing at the end of the day because of his fitness level. And he just seems comfortable and confident and all that sort of stuff. 
But whatever happened in that heat, I think it was nerves. And he just surfed lower. He surfed yeah. below his ability in the yeah. most important heat of the year. Yeah. It was really I, surprising. I would agree with you. And I think throughout the year, I don't know about you, but every time Elo's in a heat, I do get that feeling that, you know, he could be off, you know, like with, but with Gabe, you're like guaranteed, like he's not going to be, even if he's off, he's on. But when Idolo's off, you're, I don't know. And it's very rare, by the way. I mean, Idolo's got a great record, but when he enters a heat, I'm always like, okay, you know, he, he, he could be off the seat for whatever reason. There's just, it's just not quite as polished competitively as Gabe. Well, we talk about how much fun Idolo has and maybe he needs to take it seriously now. Yeah. Remember John, remember John, John, he won a world title on just natural ability. And then Zeke ran circles around him and it kind of shook him and he needed to regroup. And this might be evidence that Idolo needs to regroup and get a little serious. Yeah. I'm not sure that Idolo is not serious. I just think that, that, yeah, maybe there's something in his camp that could be implemented, whether it's, you know, a, a, a psychological coach or whatever. I don't even know who he's got employed or how it works. Well, that, but. And that's probably the, that's probably an indicator. Like, I don't know that he has a camp. Yeah. I don't either. He there's, might though. He might, you know, but, but there's other people, the camps that exist, we know about, and we don't know about his. So I'm wondering that if it doesn't exist. And so the camps that do exist, they're all about professionalism. You know, it's like the athlete figured out at some point that, they need to focus on um, either their body or the winning of the heats or whatever. So they start putting people in place to manage a lot of those questions and decisions for them. And then they can just focus on one single goal of the surfing itself. And so maybe Idolo, maybe it's well, high time for Idolo. You know, and, and, and also it's kind of like sometimes heats go this way, no matter how prepared you are. That's why sure. I think two sure. out of three is kind of good. That wave he caught the one behind Felipe, Felipe went and ripped. And, and, and Elo was behind him. That wasn't the best wave choice. You know, I mean, that wave ran quick. He had to fly and then get that floater just to kind of stay with it. And when you think of Elo, you think, okay, what he's probably going to do is a big couple turns and then a couple pumps to set up some big backside boost. And he never got that opportunity. And that was just wave selection. And you know what? You see Felipe go on the first one and another bomb's coming right to you. It's hard to not take that one and wait for the third wave or, you know, it's just, and so. So you said sometimes heats go this way and that's why the two out of three is actually where we just learned yesterday is a pretty interesting format. So let's talk about the format because with Carissa and Tati who made it to the final. So for anybody who wasn't watching, just for the record, uh, Joanne beat Stephanie, Sally Fitzgibbon beat Joanne. Tatiana then beat Sally Fitzgibbon. So basically what happened to what was supposed to happen did. Number four beat five, three beat four, two beat three, and then it ends up being one and two in the final. So Tatiana versus Carissa Moore had three heats together and Tati won heat number one. And anybody watching would probably agree Carissa Moore is the better surfer between those two. And so you said sometimes heats go that way. And we saw in that moment, even the better surfer can lose a heat. But then the second heat came around and Carissa won that back. And you figure by the third heat, it'll all kind of shake out as it's supposed to. And we did see that. Carissa did elevate, rise to the occasion on heats two and three, and the better surfer won. But I think you're right. With three heats, we see a much more um, realistic interpretation or results, you know, of yeah. who's who and what's what. Yeah, and, and in many ways, you could argue that the entire season is kind of like the two out of three heats in exactly. a longer format. And that's why you've yeah. got Gabe winning by 20,000 points, because in my opinion, you know, there's really no way that Felipe could have won that heat. The one where he, the, the second heat where Gabe did the friggin' whatever you call that thing. I don't even know what it's Flintstone called. Flintstone flip. The Flintstone flip. Like unless Felipe did another one of those on a bigger wave. Like Gabe's on a whole nother level yeah. because look, let's the air reverses that Felipe throws. Yeah. They're insane. And they're technically crazy. And Kelly broke it down pretty good, but they're not Flintstone flips. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So let's, let's 
come back to that in one second. I want to uh, ask you about Carissa and Tati real quick. Do you have any thoughts on their matchup or of them as surfers? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think hats off to Tati. I think she surfed pretty well. You know, she 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 lived up to number two, but she's just simply not on the same level as as Carissa Moore, and um, and I think that you know Carissa deserve. I think both the re results in men's and women's were perfect. You know, in my yeah. eyes. And I, I, yeah, that's, that's all I got to say about that. I agree with you. I think it's not even one and two. I think, um, Carissa's head and shoulders above number two and the scores don't reflect it. And this is all subjective, but I'm, I mean, I think Carissa's light years better. Tati has a lot of things to fix in her surfing and in her competitive game the one thing that I think she brought to the table in those heats was she was attacking the wave. So Carissa would look for an open section to do a big turn on where she knows she's going to score, but she wasn't squaring up with the lip and like throwing caution to the wind. And Tati at times will, if she's coming off the bottom and there's a vert lip, she'll go straight into that thing. The problem is she comes out bobbling and wobbling and has to reset. And it's yeah. just, it's not great. You know, it's not um, polished. And then the other hiccup I see in her surfing is um, when she does have not that vert section and she just throws like a snap essentially on the face, she does it like she transitions rails really softly and safely. And then once she's on that other rail pushes and like accentuates and it's like, it's a safety turn. It's just not dynamic at all. And it throws a lot of spray, but it's just like, it's so not hard it's, to do basically. Yeah, it's, it's a little misplaced. It's like out of rhythm. Is almost yeah. So in one sense, she's going vert with her backside and going caution of the wind. But if it's not that vert lip, she goes over to the side, leans it over on the rail and then jams it like midway through the turn. And it's just, it's like, uh, that's the very first turn I learned how to do, you know, cause it's the easiest and the safest. So, and then, you know, she falls, you know, at times, which she's got to clean up. So there's, there's still a lot of hiccups in her game. And I think she has world title potential, but I would still argue it's actually not she's not as good of a surfer as Steph who finished fifth and she's not as good as Sally at times. And, and Courtney, I would argue is kind of right up there with Tati. So Tati needs to, she's got a few things to fix despite her second place finish, but congrats on the second plate place finish. She Hold on, my, my dog's barking. Hold on. Go for it. We'll go to commercial. <clears throat> yeah. Welcome back. So you're talking about Felipe versus Gabe. Um, the, Felipe was riding a quad, first of all. I don't love quads. I've had a few that I liked, but I've never really clicked with them. And in that first heat, he had kind of um, failed on a couple of turns. There was one huge like hack that he did. And then the board just like released or let go or it like actually tipped over. And I was wondering if any of those failures, there was a couple of turns that he failed to capitalize on. I was wondering if any of those failures you thought might be related to the quad as opposed to riding a thruster. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to the, you know, I don't think one fin design is to be blamed for Felipe's falling and he did fall. Um, that's got to be put on, on him. Um, whether there's three fins or four fins, it's. I think it could be like that I don't. very that very last ex, uh, accentuation of the turn or extending of the turn. You know, there's a pivot in a third in a third fin, or there's a hold in those blocked together fins that could be that little one percent difference or five percent difference i'm sure that felipe has ridden the boards that he wrote yeah, in that heat true. numerous times and has completed the turns and felt confident and i just think that he felt the pressure he was surfing from behind he had already lost one heat and by the way can we stop calling these things matches did you notice they were trying to like force feed this phrase match tennis nobody nobody was buying it like mick one time mick fanning was like he started to say Matt and he goes, no, no. Yeah. I watched him. Yeah. Like, I watched it go through his brain cycle and he's like, it's a heat. We're in heat. Right. Heat. Right. But anyway, I'm, so I'm over the force feeding of the, 
the vernacular match. That's right. Lame. But back to the topic. Um, I felt like Felipe didn't surf up to his potential. I thought he surfed out of his skin on a couple of waves. You know, there was yeah. one on the second heat where he uh, fe he fell on an air reverse at the very end. Yeah, yeah. He's he zinged that wave like that was a I mean, nine, even with the fall. I, I don't remember what they scored him. I was talking to Noel Salas about that wave, and he's like, the judges don't get it. He was he would Noel was kind of like the judges don't understand what's happening on the wave face. That's, and Noel knows. I mean, Noel's a pretty damn good surfer, and he's he's also probably, um, you know, done a good job of of watching enough heats and surfing in enough heats to get it. Well, the judges got it right overall. You know, like we could probably analyze that one score and agree with Noel, and Kelly and Mick would agree with Noel as well because they were in the booth and they were like, "God, that would have." Because Gabe had done the Flintstone flip, and uh, Felipe's back was against the wall. And they were like, yeah, that would have been Gabe. That would have been Felipe's nine five to get him back into the lead. And then he's comfortable and he just needs a little backup score to like shut the door on Gabe. But in that air reverse that he fell on was just such a stock standard small. He did not need to be penalized for it. So I think to Noel's point. I don't even point, think he needed to do it. I don't even agreed, think he needed to do agreed. it. I just think he, at that point, that was almost like an extra section of that was the way it was done. Agreed. So in regard to judging, on the day that they did not run, Monday, yeah, Monday, they were, we were hoping they would run and they didn't. They were talking to Richie Porta in the booth in the morning show before the comp was supposed to start. And they showed the clip of Gabriel doing the Flintstone flip in a free surf on a small left on one of the small windy days. And they were like, hey, you know, this, this was going viral on the internet. How would you guys judge this, Richie? And Richie spent three minutes talking. I got zero out of Richie talking. And <laughs> I, was, I was not confident at all yeah. that they even know how to, that they as judges know how to uh, process something like that. He just spit utter nonsense. He's like, well, it's progressive move. And so we reward progression, but you know, um, aerials aren't the only type of progression. There can be, um, carves can be progressive. You know, the turns that Connor's doing the way that he's doing them are also progressive. So you can also get into the eight point range doing turns, but you know, if you're not going above the lip, then we're not really going to give you excellent scores. I'm like, wait, you're just you're saying this and then you're contradicting it and then you're coming back around to this. And they're like, well, so what would you have scored that Flintstone flip? You know? And he's like, well, he never gave an answer, but he didn't make me feel like he even knew how to process for, it was just utter nonsense. You know, yeah. I want Richie to come out and be like, you know what? Everything happens in the context of a heat, but that day that Gabriel did that, we would have given him a seven, five. It was a super innovative move. He did a turn out the back. He finished it on the inside, but it wasn't the biggest wave of the day. We saw him go on other waves that day that he hit the, you know, did crazy backside turns that would have gotten to the nine range. So in that context, that Flintstone flipped on a small left would have been a seven or whatever. Just yeah. answer the question. Yeah. You know, if it's that vague, if it's that subjective, then they're, then don't try to tell us, like, you're supposed to be pitching this as an objective decision that's being made. You need to give us an objective answer when a question is asked. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. And um, look, at, I, but, you know, to sort of summarize the whole thing, at the end of the day, they did nail it. As you said, they did a good job. They've got, we got the correct winners. Um, in my eyes, Gabe is way far ahead of everybody and it doesn't have to do with the surfing as much as it has to do with his competitive prowess like gabe can be ahead by say you know with two nines in his back pocket and go out and throw three tens and he yeah. can also be down with two sixes in his back pocket and go out and throw three tens and felipe i don't sense or a lot of the guys i don't sense if they've got two sixes and the, and the other guy's got two nines I don't sense they have the competitive, the mental wherewithal to throw three tens yeah. on top of two sixes. And I know Gabe does. I mean, and, and this is just really, to me, it's kind of, it's summarized, or it sort of crystallized a couple of things. First of all, lowers, it was a great event and lowers is a great 
venue on a number for a number of different reasons. One is it stays clean most of the day, usually, generally, yeah. even if the wind blows, unless it's a hideous south wind. Um, however, I want to see waves of consequence. I think it, it bodes well for guys like Connor if we're surfing waves of consequence. And frankly, and this kind of speaks to your format change. I don't even need to see the top five guys if the top five guys aren't going to even challenge. Right. Like we know, everyone knows it should probably be Gabe, Ilo, Felipe, and John John. And you could maybe throw somebody else in there like Kanoa or Yago Dora or somebody like that. Jordy. Jordy. Right. We know who they are. And so now I understand, look, we got to go through the year long process to get to the top five. Um, and, and the COVID year was a weird year because we had Narrabeen and Meriwether. But, um, I, I mean, look, this should have been three guys. We didn't Here. need to see five guys. So I loved this format for the record. Like, and the strength of this format was the fact that there was fewer storylines to follow. So we start off the day. We know who the five people are. And I agree with you, five might even be too many. And we watch them against one another. Firstly, man and woman versus nature was really the central battle here. And then utilizing nature to battle it out against one another. The fact that we're following fewer storylines was just so much more compelling. And having icons like Kelly and Mick following it with us, this was all the strength. And so I don't think that we necessarily need this final day format at the end of every year, but I think what this format validated was that fewer surfers is much more compelling to watch. And so I think you could actually extrapolate that through the year. Fewer surfers throughout the year coming to the pointy end that we're all kind of watching together and tracking together. And um, there's just way too many surfers that we don't care about through the entire year through every event of the year, including into the final day of the year normally. Well, you know what you said um, earlier about the format change where, look, only allow the guys into the final event of the year that could actually c catch the leader yeah. if they had won the final event of the year, like get that yeah. 10,000 points. And frankly, there was nobody. If I'm looking right. at the points right. right now, there was nobody. Gabe had won it outright. Correct. Correct. And, um, you know, so I guess that would have been a bummer, <laughs> kind of, to, only, to just not have a men's division for the finals day because Gabe won it outright. Let Gabe go surf all three heats by himself. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, like, but anyways, I thought this was a phenomenal format. I don't know how it fits into the world tour because I don't think we need a finals day format. But I, again, the strengths of it were fewer storylines to follow, best two out of three. Those are things that we could take away and figure out how to integrate into the rest of the season. Um, well, so I think that was a they're success. Not, they're not going to do away with this. This, this was too much of a success. You're going to see this again, but there's ways, there's ways we've already offered to kind of improve upon it. And again, to incorporate it into the rest of the season, I think would actually be a big improvement. The two out of three battles I think are really interesting. And the other key thing is just fewer surfers. Your um, so one other thing that I noticed, Scott, was that there were no channel islands and only one mayhem in finals day. Oh, How is. crazy is that? Yeah. There was five sharp eyes. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that too is, and, and I don't mean to extrapolate this as the reason for what we saw, but you know, the, the aging demographic of the surf space suggests, look, we're all riding mid lengths and everything. And those Channel Islands has gotten into that space in a very successful way. And I, I can't wait to get my Channel Islands mid length, you know, and, and the twin fins and all of the like sort of alternative performance boards that, that those companies are putting out. And guess who doesn't do one of those? Sharp Eye. Sharp Eye, <laughs> Sharp yeah. Eye is solely focused on making the most radical high performance surfboard um for guys like Kanoa and for Felipe and for some of the girls I think um I think Sally might ride sharp eyes or Morgan does for sure I'm not sure on the girl's side but oh, anyway Tati Tati I think yeah so 
I, again, I'm not saying that that's the reason why, because I know that those other shapers are, yeah. are also focused on high performance boards, but we know that Marcio is solely for, I mean, I don't know the last time you saw a Marcio mid-length, but no. <laughs> I don't think they exist. Um, one final thought. I know you got to go. Uh, one final thought that I had, we kind of touched on it, but I was surprised how safe everyone surfed other than Gabe and uh, up until the Gabe and Felipe heat. Like I expected yeah. everybody to come out of the gates going for tens because it's finals day. And it's, they were almost like playing it. Like, let me just get a couple of sixes and sevens on the boards. Then I'll go for it. And I just thought, God, that applies at the beginning of the season and maybe at the beginning of a normal event, but this is finals day. And so it wasn't until Felipe hit the water and Gabe hit the water that we really started to see fireworks. And um, so I was just shocked by that, disappointed by it, actually. You know, today we could have had a two out of three heat thing run in eight to 10 foot perfect Puerto Escondido. And um, I think we would have seen a, a real champion emerge. It probably would have been Gabe, but it could have also yeah. been Ilo. Um, and it could have also been Felipe, frankly, we don't know, no. but, um, no, no. <laughs> but I'd like to see, I mean, look, um, in my eyes, the most radical thing that can happen on a wave is, is a stand up barrel and getting yep. spit out. And until they incorporate that into the finals day, we're missing something. And I'll leave it at that. Well, Scott, I will see you in person for the first time in probably two years. Wow. All right. Yeah. Next well, look, the boardroom shows next weekend, not this weekend, but it's September 25th and 26th. We've got an incredible show lined up for you. We're super excited about it. Honoring Pat Rossum and the icons of foam. Best in show presented by Zio Baffa Organic Italian Wines. How it's made by Douglas Surf Company, a great exhibit on the board build process. And of course, the boardroom talks presented by Board Shaper. Uh, we've got, I think, uh, seven great talks lined up, hosted by former Surfer Magazine editor Chris Morrow. And um, it's going to be a heck of a show. Of course, the whole show presented and um, by my good friends over at US Blank. So the Boardroom International Surfboard Show, September 25th and 26th in Del Mar at the fairgrounds presented by US Blanks. You can buy tickets right now. Uh, go to boardroomshow.com. Go to boardroomshow.com. Buy your tickets. Come out and say hi to David and I and a bunch of others. I know Matt Warshaw is going to be there. I got a call from him the other day. Um, anyway, the entire surfboard manufacturing industry under one roof. It's a great place to network and and uh, see everybody and see all the great stuff. And uh, it's going to be fun. I cannot wait. Yeah, buddy. It's going to be good. So right, great show, Scott. Great show. Until next week, adios and aloha. <laughs>